We have only one guest on this week's podcast, but a great one. Robert Caro, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Robert Moses and Lyndon Johnson, joins us to talk about both of these men, his work as a journalist and a biographer, and his new book, Working. To celebrate and honor National Poetry Month, we'll have a special reading by a special poet. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. I'm Pamela Paul. Robert Caro joins us now. He is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of many books. His new book is called Working, Researching, Interviewing and Writing. He is also the author of The Years of Lyndon Johnson, four volumes of them thus far, and The Power Broker, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. Bob, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to be here. All right. So, Everyone has been greatly anticipating Volume 5 of The Years of Johnson, but instead you have written this other book, Working, Researching, Interviewing, Writing. Why did you decide to do this? Ever since The Power Broker, I kept myself out of the book. I don't think the word I appears in there many times. As soon as the book came out, people started asking me, what was it like to interview Robert Moses? And I realized that I should have put in something to tell people what that was like. So for like 45 years, I've been hearing that question. And people ask me what it's like to work in presidential libraries. What can you find out from interviews? This isn't advice to anybody, but it's sort of, I said, well, I want to give people some glimpses into how I work. So I took time out to do this book. Now I'm back doing the fifth volume. I mean, it's an interesting question about interviewing Robert Moses, because you had what, five sessions with seven, him, seven, seven sessions with him, which was very different from the Johnson biography, where he was dead already for several years before yes. you could get started. And I'm curious, you write about it a bit in working, what it, the difference was like for you writing the book, writing a biography of a person who was still alive versus writing a biography of someone who was already gone? In one sense, it's great to write about someone who's still alive because you get to meet him. Now, Moses didn't talk to me for the first couple of years of the book. Then we had seven interviews. As soon as I started asking questions, Pamela, the interviews were over. But they were long sessions, and I really got a look at him. With Johnson, you felt, oh, I came along just too late. He had died just three years before What was great about him was that he died so young, he would have been only 67 when I started, he died at 64, that everyone was still alive. He had, I think, 12 people in Johnson City High School when he was there. They were all there to be interviewed. But you can't make up for not meeting and talking to the person you're writing about. You just can't. Do you feel that absence in working on the biography of Johnson? Yes. You do everything you can to overcome that. You know, you interview the people closest to him over and over and over again, constantly asking them, what was he like if I was standing next to you? What would I see him doing? So you try to get a feeling of him. Now we have these telephone transcripts where you hear him talking. You Mm -hmm. you have hundreds and hundreds of hours. You can listen to him talking and see how he deals with people and how he gets what he wants from people. That's what's always amazing to me. Has that changed sort of the way that you've been doing your research, having access to those tapes? Yeah. I think it should change the writing of history in general, like on the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which has been sort of a mystery, what really happened there, how many attacks were there on our destroyers, you know, that led Johnson to launch these large bombing attacks on North Vietnam. Now you actually hear the communications between Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, Sinkpak, the Admiral at Honolulu, and the commander of the fleet that's in, in Vietnam. You hear this in what was really going on in real time. The other aspect of your interviewing that I thought was so interesting that you write about in this new book, Working, is the delicacy of interviews, and especially when you get to touchy subjects. And though you didn't interview Johnson for the book, you did interview Lady Bird. And I would tell a story about how you and when you approached the subject of Johnson's longtime affair with Alice Marsh. 
Well, when Johnson is in the Pacific during World War II, you're allowed, he's in Australia, you're allowed one telephone call. The senator from Texas has just died. Johnson has to decide whether to run again for the House of Representatives or to run for senator. I'm going through all the correspondence, and suddenly, in the middle of it, there is a telegram from someone signed Alice. I've never heard of Alice. She appears in no book. And it says, Lyndon, everyone else, that happened to me in the White House, everyone else thinks you should run for the Senate. I think you should run for the House. Please try to call Love Alice. I said, who is Alice? Who is this person that he makes the only one telephone call to and who is giving him political advice, which he follows? Shortly after that, so that's you know, an example of going through the papers. By sheer luck, her sister and best friend show up at the Johnson Library and ask to see me. And I go down to see them and they say, you know, we want to tell you about a woman named Alice Marsh. We don't want to portray it as some bimbo. She was really very important in Mm -hmm. Johnson's life. And they told me the whole story of this long and significant relationship in his life. So how do you then ask Lady Bird. You know, Pamela, that's the only interview I ever had in my life where I couldn't bring myself to look at the person I was interviewing. Alice was a small town girl, and she turned herself into the brilliant Washington hostess, brilliant meaning brilliant salons, and she came from a little town called Marlin. Now, no one would go to Marlin unless they were looking for information on Alice. It's a little town in the middle of nowhere. And Einar and I went up there, and we learned about her and how remarkable she was. But all of a sudden, we have a mutual friend who lived in Marlin who calls me in a panic and says, Bird, in Texas, everybody calls Lady Bird, Bird. Mm -hmm. Bird knows you've been in Marlin, so she knows you know about Alice. I said, well, that had to be. That doesn't concern me. But her secretary then shows up at my desk in the reading room and says, Mrs. Johnson would like to see you out at the ranch this weekend. We had been meeting in her office. So we sit down at the dining room table. She's at the head of the table. I'm at her right hand, and my stenographer's notebook, like, like the one you use, is, is down on my right hand taking notes. And without preamble, she starts to talk about Alice Glass, how elegant she was, how sophisticated she was, how she taught Lyndon things and everything that she taught him, he followed the rest of his life. You know, he had these long... When she met him, he was this new congressman, very awkward with long, gangly arms. She said, turn them into an asset. Always wear shirts with French cuffs and very nice cufflinks. Mm-hmm. So when people, when their attention is called to them, it's called in a, in, a, in a good way. She taught them what kind of necktie to favor, Countess Maris tie. But most of all, at crucial elements in his life, it was her advice that he followed, and in a number of cases, one in particular, it's not exaggerating very much to say she saved his career. This takes a moment to tell, but it's it's interesting. His early career is financed by a very fierce, huge Texas contractor, Herman Brown, of Mm -hmm. Brown and Root. And Herman was prepared to keep financing his right, and in return, Johnson was getting huge contracts for Brown and Root. When all of a sudden, they had a falling out. Lyndon Johnson was getting them authorization to build a dam, which they wanted, But Lyndon wanted a low-rent housing project built in Austin in what was a very poor Mexican-American neighborhood. The houses in that neighborhood were owned by Herman Brown. The tenants were paying rent to him. They were very profitable. And he was enraged that Lyndon wanted to condemn them for his housing project. And his chief lobbyist and his chief lawyer talked to him and said, you know, Herman was about to turn on Lyndon. And when Herman turned on you... He never turned back. When Alice hears about this and invites them both down to her great estate in Virginia, she sits them down at her table and says, why don't you just compromise? Give Herman the dam and Lyndon the land. And all Mm -hmm. of a sudden, everything was okay. So Lady Bird starts talking not only about her elegance. She says, the quotes are in the book. 
She was so sophisticated, so beautiful. I remember her in a succession of wonderful, beautiful dresses and me in, well, not so wonderful. And, and then she said, you know, Lyndon, basically, Lyndon always followed Alice's vice. During that whole interview, I have to say my head just stayed down and I took notes. I couldn't look at her. So that was done. Then the next week, we went back to our ordinary interviews. So she just launched into it without you even Without a word of preamble. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, I sometimes think I know something about politics. I'm really glad I don't have to write about women because <laughs> I never understood why she did that. So you had gone in there presumably thinking, how am I going to bring this up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you never... I didn't have to. She talked. She answered all my questions without a word out of me. You write in Working about the use of silence yes. in interviews. And I'd love you to talk about that for a minute. And then talk about the opposite, where you have to actually ask uncomfortable and sometimes aggressive questions. The silence thing is, is interesting. If you looked in my notebooks where I take notes on interviews, you'd find the letters S-U written very big sometimes. They mean shut up. It's because I tend to talk too much. And the thing is, if you're interviewing somebody, silence can be a real weapon for you because there's a human, seems to be a human need to fill a silence. So if you ask a question, if there's a silence, he's not answering it. If you can just shut up Mm -hmm. long enough, an amazingly large percentage of that time, he has to talk, and right. he'll give you the information you want. But you're dealing often with people who are master politicians, who presumably also know <laughs> sometimes the use of silence. And yes. I'm curious, yes. with someone like Moses, where you say, you know, he was a monologuist, and yes. he talked and he talked. Did he ever use silence? Uh, no, you, you didn't have to with Moses. With Moses, if you asked the question, he might answer it for an hour and an hour and a half. The thing about it was you didn't want to interrupt when I started an interview, as I was a young reporter, I had won a couple, well, of minor, I mean really minor journalistic awards. But when you're young and you win anything, you think you know everything. I thought I really knew how political power worked. From the minute Robert Moses started talking to me, I knew that I knew nothing compared to him. I mean, it was like I had never even dreamed of this level of political genius. I mean, it's such a tricky dance with access, right? Because with someone like Moses, he controlled access to a lot of the information and a lot of the the people around him and whether they would talk to you or not. I mean, did you worry that, oh, if I make sort of one false move here in this interview with him, he's going to tell everyone not to talk to me anymore? Well, it didn't happen quite that way. What happened was, see, over the years... Many biographers, I don't mean a few, had started or contemplated biographies of Moses. And I suppose they were told the exact same thing I was told. As soon as I wrote him saying I went, two of his public relations, they always came in pairs. These guys was named Murray Davis and Edward V. O'Brien. And they basically said to me, well, you know, Commissioner Moses will never talk to you. His family will never talk to you. His friends will never talk to you. And then they had this phrase. I'm not, I don't remember the exact wording, but what it meant was no one who ever wants a contract from the city or state will ever talk to you. <laughs> and you will never see his papers. So I had to think of something. So I drew a series of concentric circles on a pad. In the center, I put a dot. That was him. The first circle was his family and closest friends. Second was fairly close friends, people who dealt with him all the time. But they were outer rings. And I said, well, he he can think of and make sure they don't talk to me, all the people who are close to him. But he's going to forget a lot of, about a lot of people at, on the outside. So I started with them. And as I later were told, he started getting these telephone calls from people saying, this young man came to interview me about you, Bob. So for two years, he didn't talk to me. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from his daughter, Jane. She called him Papa Bear. She said, well, Papa Bear will talk to you. Come out and meet him at, at Oak Beach. And I do not know why he changed his mind on that. I was told something. It's uh, quite complimentary to me. So 
But it's the only explanation I was ever given. I became very friendly over the years with his chief aide, a guy named Sid Shapiro. He said, well, you know, the commissioner realized with you that finally a biographer had come along who was going to do the book whether he wanted it or not. I don't know if that's true. Mm -hmm. But we had seven interviews which were an education for me. And you ultimately did get a copy of all of his papers. You often talk about how your books are about power, about these two men who accumulated and wielded power in two very different arenas and sort of fundamentally changed the use of powers in within those two different arenas. But as a reader, it strikes me that your books are as much about the powerless as they are about the powerful. And you start off master of the Senate, for example, with a, uh, a woman who cannot vote. It feels like your, your, your heart and some of the most moving passages are really about the people who didn't have the power. You know, and when you deal with them that way, I'm so glad that's so perceptive of you to pick that thing up because it's an example. If you say, I'm not going to write just about the powerful, I'm going to write about the powerless and the effect that power has on them. So I'm trying to show in the in Master of the Senate, Johnson does what hasn't been done for 87 years. He gets a civil rights bill through the Senate that's controlled by the South. So that's quite a story. But as part of the story, I wanted to show exactly how hard it was and what happened to black people in the South in the 1950s who tried to register to vote. So I'm reading all the testimony that black people gave before the United States Civil Rights Commission. And, you know, some of these stories make you cry or fill you with rage. So I came across the testimony of this woman, Margaret Frost, who was humiliated with the questions she asked, but she didn't give up. She went home and studied, and about six months later, she went back before these same three registrars, and they humiliated her again. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, I have this story. But the thing is, there's always more to the story. And her husband, in the course of her talking to me, she mentioned, just in passing, that her husband had registered to vote, David Frost. So I said, well, I'd like to talk to him. He didn't want to talk to me at first, but I eventually spoke to him on the phone, and he told me the following story. When he registered to vote, a car came by and men shot out with rifles the lights on his porch. He wanted to call the police, but as the car drove away, he realized it was a police car. All of a sudden, Pamela, you said, so that's what it was like to be a black person in the South. There was no place to turn, no one to protect you. So the whole story came, there was a whole other dimension to me. I want to talk a bit specifically about Master of the Senate. Listeners of this podcast, I've heard a bit about it in the last few weeks as I was reading the book. And there are certain aspects of the writing in this book that I think you cover also in your new book, Working. And I want to talk about those different aspects. One is the sense of place, another storytelling and pacing, and the third is the development of your characters. But sort of as background to all of that, is the process of writing and editing. Because with The Power Broker, we know that about 350,000 words of this book did not end up in the final book. I imagine that that is true as long as they are of books in the years of Johnson. I'm curious about what your process is like in terms of your relationship with your editor, Bob Gottlieb, and how that works. <laughs> well, it's a long relationship. You know, he became my editor in 1971. That's 48 years. Wow. It hasn't been always a peaceful relationship. Let's say we're both strong-minded people. But he's a great editor for me. I think he's, well, he's a great editor. And sometimes I think no one but he could have edited me. Because what he does, I mean, he's not going to let you go. If he makes a suggestion and you don't want to accept it, you're not going to turn the next page. He's going to tell you why you should change it. So in answering that, you have to think about what you did. That's very valuable to me because my books take so long. 
my publisher and my editor never bother me. So I'm sort of in a vacuum in, in a way. And it's easy to fool yourself that you're doing it better than you are doing it. But as you're writing this, you, you, you're you forced to say, what would Bob think of this? Mm-hmm. Do you know? If you saw us up till this the working book where things became friendly, it was, it was one that took 45 <laughs> years. But from the very first time, he's a guy who never used to go out for lunch. I never have lunches. We worked on that book. You know, the cutting out of the 350,000 words was really hard. And I think even Bob would say to you, we didn't do it just because they were superfluous. I think he said something like, we, we cut 350,000 really good words. Yeah. Ne- neither of us wanted to do that, but we're so on the same wavelength. So in order to get enough money to finish The Power Broker, I had to sign a two-book contract. The second book was for a biography of Fiorello LaGuardia. So I finished The Power Broker, and I really don't want to do a LaGuardia biography. I covered this. I can't stand ever to go back and do the same thing again. Mm-hmm. And... I'm saying, but you know, I realize now that what I was doing in The Power Broker was not a biography of Moses. It was a study of urban political power in cities, how real power works. Mm -hmm. When you're not elected to anything, what is the real power that you get? I said, I want to do that for national power. And I know who I want to do it through. I want to do it through Lyndon Johnson. And I never want to have to cut out words that I don't think should be cut again. I want to do it in volumes. I said, but Knopf, my publisher, will never let me do that. I'm under contract. So I'm sitting there starting the LaGuardia biography, and I get a call from Bob, and he says something like, listen, I know your famous temper. Bob is always saying, Bob Carroll has a terrible temper, but I'm a very (laughs) even-tempered guy. Untrue. Okay, it's two people with a terrible temper. So he says, I know your temper. I want you to come in and see me, and I don't want you to say anything until I finish talking. I have a suggestion for you. So I went in, and he says, I know you want to do this LaGuardia biography, but I don't think you should do that. I think you've done it all already. But I do have another subject that I'd like you to do. I'd like to suggest that you do Lyndon Johnson, and I think you should do it in volumes. So many times in our lives all these years of editing, you say, although we really have bitter fights over some things, we're both sort of on a very basic level on exactly the same wavelength. And I'm grateful to have had it all my my life. Do you ever hand in to him parts of the book or do you, you wait until it's all done? I never show anybody except Ina. One exception, I needed more money when I was doing one of these volumes, Mm -hmm. so I had to show what I had done. That's the only time. I don't show anybody anything until it's all done. So I want to talk about, because you work on the book in its entirety, about the structure specifically of Master of the Senate, because it's very interesting. There's been a big gap between this book and and Means of Ascent, the second volume. And I was nervous as a reader going into it because I had not read The Path to Power and Means of Ascent in decades. So I thought, oh gosh, you know, am I going to be able to gain entry into this? And you started off in a very surprising way by devoting over a little over 100 pages to the institution of the Senate itself, a kind of mini biography of the Senate and, and a kind of history of the United States as seen through the lens of the Senate. How did you decide to do that? And did you know from the beginning you were going to approach it that way? No, not at all. I thought Master of the Senate, which is, I forget how long it is, but it's almost a thousand pages. I'm looking it's at it. It's a little it. over a thousand no, pages. I'm looking at how big it is. <laughs> yes, I, I know very well. <laughs> well, I said, but as I'm doing the Senate, I'm the nut who sat in the gallery. You know, I'm up there all day. The tourist groups come in and out. I'm still there. The senators are looking up at me. Who is this guy? You know, but I'm realizing it's an entire world that I don't know, and in fact, a world that almost nobody knows. And it was really important at times in American history. And it's important to show Lyndon Johnson's genius, how he changed the Senate so that it really worked. The books are called 
the years of Lyndon Johnson. That's because it's, the books are not supposed to be about just Lyndon Johnson. They're supposed to be a history of America for perhaps 60 years. So I start writing this, and I said, this is a story nobody knows, and it's going to take, I suppose, uh, 100 pages, maybe 60, 70,000 words. So I wrote it, and I said, well, I think this should be published. Where am I going to put it? If I start the book like this, nobody's going to read the book. And I tried to break it up and put it, parts of it at the beginning of other chapters to italicize parts and put it into other chapters. Finally, I said, to hell with it. This belongs at the beginning of the book. That's where I want it to be. That's where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So I gave the manuscript to Gottlieb, and he said something like, you know, said something complimentary, but I did not, he doesn't, I don't, I don't get a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> he said something, he said, you know, and that's the only place it should go, right at the beginning of the book. I don't think many editors would have said that. So you start off with this first section about the Senate. And one of the things that struck me about this book is that while it's very long, the pace keeps moving because you keep sort of changing a little bit what it is you're doing. And you have these mini stories within the book and even mini biographies within the book. And I guess first, how did you decide, OK, here's where I'm going to kind of home in and, and tell maybe a small story, but blow it out to illustrate something versus I need to describe what happened, let's say, between 1955 and 1957? Well, there's human drama. I tell the story of Leland Olds, a name that no one knew. I had read it, but I had no idea. So the beginning of the, this book, right at the beginning, Johnson comes to the Senate, and he wants to cement himself with the Texas oil men and the Texas contractors. And up for confirmation is a man named Leland Olds, who had been on the Federal Power Commission, which regulates the oil industry. So it's mentioned in all the Johnson by that he holds hearings on Olds and paints him as a communist. Some of these books say he was a communist. Paints him as a communist and de defeats his nomination. I said, well, I want to read the hearings. Mm -hmm. so you ask why the books take so long. Hearings are a lot of reading because there's a lot of extraneous matter. But woven through this hearing, I say, I am reading a story of a man, Lyndon Johnson, destroying another human being for political ends. I can't believe it. I mean, I, rem I remember reading these hearings all night, underlining them. I said, look what he's doing here. He takes this man who was a young young man in his 20s, had flirted with the Communist Party and had written for the Daily Worker, and painted him as a committed communist and destroyed his life. I mean, Olds was a respected man. After that, he lived the rest of his life always struggling for money, shunned by all his, almost all his old friends because it wasn't safe to be known to be his friends, and Johnson is doing this, and it's sort of horrible. So I tried to find everybody who was connected with it, and I found one aide who is standing. Johnson has just had a cross-examination of old, saying, you know, you, do you still believe this? He would quote articles from the 20s. Olds would try to explain that he didn't believe it, but Johnson would cut him off. And there's a man standing with Leland Olds, in the luncheon break for the hearings or a recess break, I don't remember. And Johnson comes out and throws his arms around Olds and says, throws one arm around the shoulder and says, I hope you're not taking this personally, Leland. It's just politics, you know. So I said, I, I'm going to tell this story. When you say you're going to tell a story like that, Pamela, you know it's going to take a lot of pages if you tell it right because mm -hmm. it's a human story and you have to paint two human beings, Lyndon Johnson and Leland Olds. Sometimes you get a feeling that you've done the right thing. When this book comes out, I mean, no one had heard of Leland Olds anymore. I'm signing books. I think it was in, in some west, I think it was in Seattle, but I don't really remember. And, you know, you're sitting there, so there's a, you give a talk, it's a long line of people. All of a sudden, this voice says to me, I'm Leland Olds' granddaughter. 
I want to thank you for saving my grandfather's reputation. Well, I have to tell you, there are moments when you do these books that you feel good. There are a lot of moments when you don't feel good about what you did, but there are moments when you feel good about something. Wow. I mean, you read that that biography, and it is like a mini biography of, of Leland Olds. And to this day, I mean, if you go onto Wikipedia, he's got like three paragraphs. And what you do is that rather than start with the facts of the situation, which you, as you state, that, okay, here's someone for political purposes in order to win the presidency, in order to gain the trust and the money of this lobby in Texas. He needs to defeat this nomination. Rather than start there, you start with, here's this guy, Leland Olds. And for a moment, (laughs) the reader thinks, why are we talking about Leland Olds, who comes across as, you know, just a good person, a real idealist and public servant. I thought that it was interesting that you did that, too, with other characters, other sort of mini biographies that appear in the book, that even someone like Richard Russell you start off and we don't we don't have a sense of Russell as a tremendous racist from the very beginning. We hear a lot about the good things that he did. And it isn't until it's almost novelistic what you do with the character development that you don't the same thing with Eastman, who sort of flits in and out in the earlier parts, and it isn't until much later in the book that you realize this guy is a real repressive racist. A, a hater. I mean, a, a, a hater of, of, of blacks. When you research, you read the newspaper articles, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Russell is held up as the beau ideal of, of a senator, the perfect senator. And in foreign affairs, he really is, he's like one of the great senators of Rome. When you read about him, you study his speeches, you say, this must be what the great senators of Rome were like. He, he had this world view, American army should do this. It was a very intelligent and informed world view. Then you start reading the congressional record, and you see, you can't believe the racism, the hatred, that sometimes he's reading a speech that, you know, he's carefully edited, and the hatred comes through. And then you realize, this is the guy who for 30 years kept the Senate, someone said the Senate was the South's revenge for for Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. Nothing can get through the Senate that Russell doesn't want. So I said, well, I can either show the power of the South in the Senate through giving the reader a lecture, or I can show it through doing a biography of the man who embodied that power, Richard Russell. I have to make the reader really see him. So what I did was I went down to his town, Winder. You know, I'm a Northeastern, a New York person. No matter what you think about racism, you don't know it. So he was dead. He lived in this house. His father was a a judge and, and a powerful judge. When his father died, Russell idolized the father. And he engra- he built an obelisk. You know, it's not a huge house. It's a nice house, but it's not a huge house. In the back of it, he builds an obelisk to his father. And on it, it says, lover of the old South, defender of the new. So you, you start talking. And one of the things you realize is it wasn't just that he opposed every attempt to make lynching a federal crime. There were two lynchings. You say, where was this lynch? You're, you're reading the weekly newspaper, the Winder, whatever it was, and they talk, you know, very short. There was an incident on the so-and-so road, you know. So that's a lynching, you know, you're talking about. Say, that's just down this road fr- from his house. And then he had two nephews, the law firm... Pamela was still called Russell and Russell. So I made friends with the two nephews. We were walking. I don't, I don't remember that the size walks were wooden. Maybe they were, but most of that town is not white. It's black. So it would be an exaggeration for me to say that anyone— we walked abreast, you know, mm-hmm. filling the, the sidewalk. People were coming towards us, black people. I don't want to say, because I don't really remember that happening— that anyone actually stepped off the sidewalk to give us way. But I saw the eyes of the people coming towards us. 
and they were ready to step off the sidewalk. And I just hated. I mean, I it just you came back from that. You said, if you make make a picture of Russell correctly, I don't say I did it correctly. It was very hard. I rewrote that thing. If you do it, you're going to show two things: the greatness of this man in foreign affairs and directing the armies of the empire. Let's put it in Roman terms, mm -hmm. you know. And the horror of this man in playing the leading role in keeping laws to help black people from passing for decades. And then you say, but Lyndon Johnson made Russell believe. Why did he raise Lyndon Johnson to power? Russell is the guy who raised Lyndon Johnson to power. Then you said, you mean Lyndon Johnson made Russell believe that he believed the same way he did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite a story. You are famous for taking notes by hand, for writing your first and second and third drafts in longhand, and then working on a, a manual typewriter. Has technology in any way, there's so much that has been digitized and that's now available in video and readily accessible, has any of this had an effect on the way that you do your research and write? It has had no effect on the way I write. I still write in the way you just described, in longhand and on a typewriter. It has had a terrific effect on my research because the computer makes research. Like, there are all these hearings. I'm doing Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The executive sessions of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee are thousands, I don't even know, they're thousands of small print pages. You really can't read it all, but with, a, just say one thing, control fine. You want to know yes. what Richard Russell, you know, said? That's easy. So, yes, it's helped me a lot in recent years. In recent because years. you talk about those, you know, huge files just down in the Johnson Library. Is that now all digitized and searchable? No, almost none of it is digitized and searchable. So I, some of it still hasn't changed? Most of that library hasn't been digitized. Wow. You just have to pick the boxes that you feel you ought to turn every page in and use them. You start off this book talking about your experience as a newspaper reporter, mostly for Newsday on Long Island, where I grew up. And I'm curious about two things. One, what was the most important thing you learned as a newspaper reporter that helped you in, the, in your writing, in the process of writing these biographies? And is there anything that you had to kind of forget because it wasn't useful or it wasn't helpful to you? Well, the most important thing I learned is what I talk about in working. The very first piece of advice, I was a new reporter. I'd never done investigative work. I had this old editor guy out of the front page. I was the first Ivy League graduate who had ever worked in his city room, and I was hired just because he went was on vacation. They want to play a joke on him. He wouldn't even talk to me. Then I got thrown into it and doing something investigative. And he liked this memo I wrote. He said, exactly. I didn't know someone from Princeton could do digging like this. From now on, you do investigative work. I, with my usual poise, said something like, but I don't know anything about investigative work. And this old guy looked at me and he said, I've never forgotten the exact words. Just remember one thing. Turn every page. Never assume anything. Turn every goddamn page. And, you know, of course you can't do that in the Johnson Library, but if you're doing a topic like the Gulf of Duncan, it may take months, but you can do it, to turn every page. And, and over and over again, I, I, his name is Alan Hathaway. I've said to myself, thank you, Alan, because I find some amazing thing there in a, in a box just filled with the rest of it is just innocuous stuff. And was there anything that you felt like, you know what, you just had to kind of forget it from your reporting days? Yeah. Working fast. People don't believe this anymore. I was a really fast rewrite man, but I never thought things all the way through. You, you don't as a daily reporter, to tell you the truth. When I started to write The Power Broker, I suddenly realized how complicated this was going to be, that I didn't understand Mo where Moses got his power. There was so much I didn't understand about it. I was going to have to think things all the way through. So that's really the reason, Pamela, where I write my first drafts in longhand, because that's the slowest way of committing your thoughts to paper. 
I do a lot of drafts in longhand, and then I go to a, not a manual, but an electric typewriter. I don't want to, to write on a computer. Computer is too easy mm -hmm. for me. It's too fast for me. I want to slow myself down. All right. Well, taking a cue from your writing on interviewing, I've saved what is, for me at least, the most difficult question, because I know it's one that you hate getting. And so I'm going to try not to ask it in the most simplistic way. I know from your book working that you don't like people asking you if you like Johnson. So I don't want to ask it in that way exactly. But perhaps two-part kind of question. The larger question is, do you feel like you get 100% at this point his character and as part of that, do you find your sympathies with him sort of coming and going? I mean, he changed a lot, right, over the course of his life, and he was changed by the events of his life. I'm just curious how your sort of personal understanding and sympathies with him or against him have shifted over time. Yeah, it's a great way to put that question. So I spent a lot of time, you know, with his brothers and his sisters, classmates in high school and college, the guys who were in his first political machine, I felt I came to understand this character. It's a very strong character. It's sort of formed in his terrible boyhood. You know, you can't really think about Lyndon Johnson's boyhood without wanting to cry for him because it was a terrible, humiliating boyhood in this isolated town, which is the whole world. And in this town, his father, who was once the most respected man in it, becomes the laughing stock of the town. And his family, is they lose the Johnson Ranch. The father makes one mistake. They lose the Johnson Ranch. They're living in a little town in Johnson City. And every month they have to worry that the bank's going to take that house away. They offer no food in the house and neighbors have to... It was humiliating and terrible. It's a complicated character. There's a deep well of compassion, and you see it when he's young, when he's a school teacher teaching Mexican-American kids. You see it when he's president, and he gives the great civil rights speech, and his speechwriter, Richard Goodwin, says, do you really mean this? And he says, listen, when I was teaching those kids in Cthulhu, I swore that if I ever had the power, I'd help them, and I have the power and now I mean to use it. You say, that's a consistent strand. Then you say, this is a guy, braggadocio, super masculinity. He used to refer to his private parts a lot in a very boastful way. <laughs> There's you some great anecdotes about that <laughs> in the books. I'm not sure I'm going to, rep <laughs> not sure I'm going to repeat them on this one. But you say, in Vietnam, so much of it owes to that side of his character. But if you're really asking me, does my view of his character change? I felt before I started writing the first volume that I had done everything I could to understand this complicated character. And I felt that his life plays out. It doesn't play out in a consistent way, but it plays out in a way consistent with that character. All right. Well, that's a, a very good and careful answer. And I feel like we'll find out more from that when we get to volume five of the years of Lyndon Johnson. But also, there is really a lot of insight into that in this new book, which is a f fascinating behind the scenes. The book, again, is called Working, Researching, Interviewing and Writing by Robert Caro. Bob, it has been such a pleasure having you here. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. This is Greg Coles, the Book Review's poetry editor. For National Poetry Month, we've invited poets onto the podcast to read a poem that's meaningful to them. This week, Reginald Dwayne Betts, whose most recent book was Bastards of the Reagan Era and whose next book, Felon, will be released in October, reads May 24th, 1980 by Joseph Brodsky. I have braved for want of wild beasts, still cages. 
called my term and nickname on bunks and rafters. Lived by the sea, flashed aces in an oasis. Down with the devil knows whom and tails on truffles. From the height of a glacier, I beheld half a world. The earthly with. Twice have drowned, thrice let knives rake my nitty gritty. Quit the country that bore and nursed me. Those who forgot me would make a city. I have waded the steps that saw yellow huns in saddles. Worn the clothes nowadays back in fashion in every quarter. Planet rye, tarred the roofs of pigsties and stables. Guzzled everything save dry water. I have admitted the century's third eye into my wet and foul dreams. Munch the bread of exile. It's stale and warty. Granted my lungs all sounds except the howl switched to a whisper. Now I am 40. What should I say about my life that is long and a boy's transparency? Broken eggs make me grieve. The omelet, though, makes me vomit. Yet until brown clay has been rammed down my larynx, only gratitude will be gushing from it. This is John Williams, and I am joined by my colleague Alexandra Alter to talk about some literary news this week. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, John. Some timely news to talk about. One thing is that the Pulitzer Prizes were announced earlier this week, and in addition to the journalism prizes, of which the Times won a couple, and we're proud of that, there are the literary awards, which everyone always looks forward to, and in five categories. So I'll start with the the fiction category that was won by Richard Powers for his novel The Overstory. Powers is a very brainy novelist, as everyone knows, but I think that this book even stretched that to a new limit yeah. because it is it stars trees. The protagonists uh, are trees, which I think is so imaginative and, and wild and great. And it was nice to see him get this. I was sort of surprised my money was on Tommy Orange's There There. I even sent an email a few <laughs> hours before the announcement because I wanted like a time stamped record in case I was correct. Um, he was a finalist and it's sort of a kaleidoscopic look at what it means to be Native American, particularly a young urban Native American today. But sometimes Pulitzers can get a little political. And so I was thinking maybe some of the novels that were nominated, like also Rebecca Mackay's The Great Believers, which touches on the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, was a you know, good contender tender too. Mm -hmm. But I'm always kind of delighted when it's just something purely imaginative and literary that really stretches the bounds of what we think a novel can do wins because that's, you know, that's what fiction can do. So it was it was great to see the overstory win. And it was on so many best of 2018 lists that it actually was out of stock for a while around Christmas. So I know that his publisher has been busily reprinting, and I'm sure this will create another sales spike. Oh, I'm sure. It always does. And Powers has sort of won every other award, I think, under the sun. So he was a finalist for the Pulitzer back in the late aughts for a book called The Echo Maker. But So it's nice to see him finally win. In the poetry category, a poet named Forrest Gander won for a collection called Be With. And it's a sad collection, shot through with grief, because it concerns, among other subjects, the death of his wife, another acclaimed poet, C.D. Wright, who died in 2016, quite suddenly, I think. She was in her late 60s. And it also deals with things like border issues and immigration. But I think that there are many deeply personal poems about about dealing with the loss of his wife. The other finalists in that category were Field by Joss Charles and Like by A.E. Stallings. And the other three categories are all nonfiction categories, which is kind of funny to me because I've always wondered about this. They get to squeeze in a couple of biographies, for instance, in this year, even though there's only one biography category, but there's a general nonfiction category, so they can also hit it there. But the big one, I think the history winner this year was one that at least I had heard a lot of people predicting in the days before the prize was announced, which was David W. Blight's big biography of Frederick Douglass, uh, which is just titled Frederick Douglass, subtitled Prophet of Freedom. And that got a lot of great reviews when it came out and was considered just a really sprawling, comprehensive, incredible look at an incredible American life. And the finalists in that category were Civilizing Torture by W. Fitzhugh Brundage and American Eden, David Hosack, Botany and Medicine in the Garden of the Early Republic by Victoria Johnson. So Frederick Douglass won in history. So what won in biography? 
That left the field open for another biography. Yes, yes. In biography, the winner was The New Negro, The Life of Elaine Locke by Jeffrey C. Stewart. And both of those books, the uh, Frederick Douglass book and this biography of Elaine Locke, got a ton of critical attention and awards love last year. The Frederick Douglass book was also out of stock around the holidays. (laughs) Um, Publishers were really kind of caught off guard by the demand for print books this year, which was great. Print sales have been up and in these categories, too, of sort of highbrow nonfiction that's not political, which is super hard to break through with in this climate. And, right, that's um, not current affairs exactly. based. Exactly, yeah. and, and literary, challenging literary fiction like The Overstory and like They're There. I mean, these books have been selling really well. So it's I think 2018 was a remarkable year for publishing, and we can sort of see that reflected in the prizes this year. I think another reason the Poulters might have an extra bump this year, they talk about sort of the, you know, the prize awards bump that books get when sales spike there was no Nobel, and so it's a lot mm. of the the attention that gets drawn around for for different literary awards. I feel like there was extra weight on on the Booker and the Pulitzer. Yeah. There, well, there will be two. <laughs> I believe there are going to be two Nobels year. next true. this year, so we'll yeah. have a double bump. I'll just say about the the Elaine Locke bio. I'm not sure that he's quite as well known as Frederick Douglass to the average American, but he was considered the father of the Harlem Renaissance. He was a mentor to Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and others. And this is a Stewart's book is a very very big book about another big life. The finalists in the biography category were The Road Not Taken, Edward Lansdale and the American Tragedy in Vietnam by Max Boot and Proust's Duchess by Carolyn Weber, who's a frequent contributor to the book review. And so those those two finalists as well. General nonfiction was won by Eliza Griswold for her book Amity and Prosperity, One Family and the Fracturing of America. And this was an interesting book because she spent a lot of time in one Pennsylvania town I think it was six or seven years that she spent to find out how fracking affected the town and its residents. And so it's a very on the ground level look at a big a big political issue, but one that she sort of treats on a very personal level. And the finalists in that category were Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore by Elizabeth Rush and In a Day's Work by Bernice Young. So those are the Pulitzers, and that's happy news for everybody. Um, In slightly more stressful news, uh, (laughs) uh, as we speak and as we're recording this this morning, all of Washington is scrambling to get a, a look at the Mueller report and see what's in it, what's been redacted, how to deal with it. And there is a publishing angle to this story. Always a as publishing you've angle. Of <laughs> yes. As a obsessive follower of the Mueller report and its gradual, slow release into the public, I've been interested to see how publishers are handling it. A number of publishers had announced their plans, you know, quite early really to to publish this report when it was made public and they even put up pre-orders on Amazon, which some people thought was a little sketchy because who knows what how long it's going to be, how redacted it's going to be. Mm. But now that the report is out, publishers are really flying into high gear and doing as much as they can to turn it around quickly. So Skyhorse is one of the publishers that will be releasing it with an introduction by Alan Dershowitz, interestingly. Mm. And their edition, they're hoping to get those out within a week And they're planning a first printing of 200,000 copies, which they have increased because of demand. Scribner is also planning to release a version of the Mueller report, and they are going to include an introduction and analysis of the materials by Washington Post reporters to sort of put that in context. And they are aiming to get that out very quickly as well and planning a very big first printing of 350,000 to 400,000 copies. Finally, Melville House is another contender here. You can see a lot of a lot of publishers see the appeal. They are releasing a mass market paperback edition, and they're planning a print run of fifty thousand copies. They told Publishers Weekly, so they're aiming to get that out in about ten days. So it sounds like we have at least three competitors There's on the at market least three. <laughs> for the Mueller Report audience. Yes, and, and I guess because it's a public document, anyone, anyone who wants could, to, you I could do it. Yeah, it. I mean, maybe we should. Maybe I'll get someone to write an introduction. I'll do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then you said that they're going to publish. 200,000, 350,000. I thought there were printing issues right now in publishing. Are they there getting are, these, but uh, apparently, like, Michelle Obama's book is, you know... Finally slowed down I, a tiny I bit. I don't know how much it's slowed down, but they've used every piece of paper in the country to print as many as they can. So I think you can actually book time on the printers again. One edition that I think people will be interested in, too, because it's such a popular category right now, is an audiobook that will be coming from Audible of the Mueller Report. I don't know who's going to narrate it. I'm kind of hoping Robert De Niro, since he's been <laughs> playing Mueller on Saturday Night Live, but I, I doubt that's going to happen. <laughs> and that's going to be released for free. 
So interesting. Well, yeah. it'll be it'll be very interesting after you know all of the news cycles and people's attention to see just how many people buy the book and, exactly. and put down money for yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, the Star Report was a bestseller, a huge bestseller. So, I mean, I think I might have mentioned this before as I've obsessively talked about it on the podcast, but because the Mueller report, there's so many conflicting opinions about it. So far, we've gotten, you know, Democrats sort of saying they're expecting to find more damning information in there. We have the attorney general saying it's close to an exoneration, the president himself saying it's a complete exoneration. So I think in this instance, it's not so cut and dry. People are going to want to analyze it for themselves. Well, I'm sure that as the numbers and the feedback from readers come in, you'll be back on the podcast to discuss it. (laughs) My plan is to release a Mad Lib so that you can fill in the redacted sentences yourself. You should not have said that on air. Someone's (laughs) going to steal that. That's a billion dollar idea. (laughs) Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks for having me. Joining us now to talk about what we're reading, my colleagues Greg Coles, Tina Jordan, and John Williams. Hey, guys. Hi, Pamela. All right, John, let's start with you. I'm reading a book called Lost Children Archive, which got a lot of attention this year when it was published just a couple months ago, I think, by Valeria Luiselli. And I had read a couple of Luiselli's earlier books. I think one was called Faces in the Crowd, and, and there was another slender book. And they were fairly short, very beautiful, very smart, full of great imagery, but a bit oblique and a bit elliptical, which I like, but that's what they were. And looking at this book, which is much longer and seems sort of more ambitious narratively, I wondered if that style would really fit a book like that. And it turns out that she's just doing this totally different thing, which I'm very impressed by and enjoying. I'm about halfway through, which is that she is just telling a bigger story with sort of more traditional digressions and more traditional thoughts about marriage and children and And essentially and mostly immigration because it's set against the border crisis and it's about two people in New York, a married couple with two children, one from one each from a previous marriage. And they drive across country. They're two. I think they I'll get this word wrong. It's like acoustomologists. They take sound recordings for sound documentaries. And the husband is obsessed with the Apaches and he's very progressive, teaches his kids about, you know, American imperialism and and the genocide of native peoples and the wife who's also very liberal is is feeling alienated from him and she's working on her own project involving lost children meaning kids who try to immigrate to the united states and get lost in the desert or or worse and they're making these pit stops at motels and at graceland and at diners and um, she's just kind of musing on both the the strains in her marriage the way she's trying to raise her kids and the way she's trying to teach her kids about how the world can be bad without traumatizing them. It's really great. One of the things I've been wondering about since you've read the earlier books is those were both and her other books published by small independent publishers written in Spanish and then translated. Mm-hmm. I think this is her second book written in English. And this one is a major publishing house, a uh, very big book in every way. Okay. Does it feel different? Like, does it feel more commercial, more accessible? It is more accessible. I don't know how conscious that is as a decision. I think she can just do both registers. There, there was, it's a little bit insider baseball, but I guess our listeners are, are pretty insidery at this point. But the the other thing was that, yes, this was a book from Knopf, which is sort of the, one of the most prestigious, large, historic publishers in the United States. And Her previous books were with smaller, great presses, but probably didn't have the same expectations for how Mm -hmm. well they would sell or the attention they would get. So there is also a sort of satisfying sense of watching a writer take a more ambitious swing and hit the ball. More ambitious is maybe unfair to her, but just a different type of swing and being able to do that, too. She's really rising even further in my estimation than she already was. All right. Over to you, Greg. It looks like you have something also ambitious. Yeah, well, you haven't heard me talking about Ulysses for a while, and there's, <laughs> I, <laughs> there is a good reason for that, namely shame. I've pretty much stalled out in the, the long, very long night town section of Ulysses. It's the Circe's section. It is all very hallucinatory and dreamlike. When I first engaged in reading Ulysses, a former teacher of mine, Michael Cunningham, the novelist, said, I wonder if you'll make it through Night Town. And so far, Michael, the answer is no. But because Mayor Pete Buttigieg, if I said that right, you did, has recently been in the news as a big fan of Ulysses, and he's talked about it as, well, it's a book that really gives you empathy and lets you see that other people are as neurotic as you are. 
which is all well and good and and true as far as it goes, but it doesn't get at the very weirdness of this book. And it it sent me back, the, the fact that Ulysses has been a news story lately sent me back to Ulysses. And I've I've pushed forward. I'm pr- proud to say that I'm now less than 200 pages from the end of Ulysses, still in the middle of Night Town. I had taken Night Town at the beginning to be a dream sequence and and dream sequence from the character, the perspective of Bloom. But it's shifted now to being Stephen Dedalus's dream sequence, which kind of calls into question the whole idea whether it can be a dream at all, if it's shifting points of view from one character to another. It ends up in a brothel, and there's there's such weird stuff. There's gender-bending stuff. At one point, Bloom, who's being cuckolded, as this is happening, you know, the proprietor of the brothel is offering to let Bloom peek through the keyhole at his wife, Molly, and her paramour, Blazes Boylan. And at the same time, because of this cuckolding, Bloom is being completely emasculated and the brothel's madam is turning into a male pimp and Bloom himself is turning into a woman wearing skirts and Bella, who's the madam, becomes Bello, the pimp, and and is offering to pimp Bloom, who's now a woman, out to the to the Johns at this brothel. So it's all very kind of phantasmagoric um, and and hallucinatory. And then it shifts, and you're you're suddenly in Stephen's point of view. So I'm making tiny tiny progress. I will get to it. Um, I'm feeling a little bit competitive now with Mayor Pete. <laughs> <laughs> And, and um, I, I need that competition to keep reading a book like this, where I stalled out and it was just reading it on, on my own. At the same time, I've also turned to a book that I had started a few years ago and had to put down for other reasons. It's a book called Goodbye Vitamin by a woman named Rachel Kong. Her previous book before this was a nonfiction book in praise of the egg. And it might help you to know that Rachel Kong is a former editor at large at the food magazine Lucky Peach, which I think is no longer with us. It was this kind of lovely literary magazine devoted to food, but all about kind of good writing. And Rachel Kong went on the side and wrote this novel that was about a young woman at kind of loose ends. Her engagement has just broken off, and her father is developing dementia, probably Alzheimer's, although you can't tell that until an actual autopsy. And her mother asks her to stay home with him for the year to kind of keep an eye on things. And the reason that I put the book down when I first started reading it is that back in my writing school days, I was working on a novel about a young woman at loose ends who takes a year off to go look after her father with Alzheimer's. And I just thought, oh, no, (laughs) I can't read this book that, that was so much like mine. But in fact, it's nothing at all like mine. It's completely different tone, completely different plots, you know, except for those surface similarities. And I'm really enjoying it. She is, as a debut novelist and a fairly young woman, I think she's still in her 30s, she just seems like a really promising voice. It's written as journal entries, and so it's got this built-in, almost epistolary format. It's just kind of great conversational humor, observational humor. She's It's a very light book, considering that it's taking on quite a heavy subject. Tina, you're not reading anything light. I'm not reading anything light. It's almost not like really reading. It's it's sort of like looking. I have The Magic of Handwriting, which is the catalog that accompanied a an exhibit at the Morgan Library, which is just a few blocks from here, which I think, Greg, you said you saw. I, I did. I loved that, that exhibit. Right. And it was just between 100 and 200 examples of handwriting. People's signatures and handwriting. Yeah, letters and journals and, journals. and even like th- things like the dog license right. applications. Signed photos, yeah. right. Contracts, you know, leases. Yeah. There's just all kinds of things in here. How Stephen Hawking signed his books yeah, as it, a thumbprint. It was not just writers, but scientists and musicians and politicians. Right. Actually, I'm going to read from the table of contents because that makes it easier. So it's divided into chapters art. History, 20th century Europe, literature, science, music, philosophy, exploration, entertainment. Yeah. I always have had an interest in font. I like, I'm one of those people who always is careful about the font. I love font and typefaces. I do too, but I also am interested in handwriting and I've become even more interested in it at the times because there are so many archival stories about 19th century signature and handwriting. And as you know, I'm a big 
archives. We fiend. did articles about 19th century handwriting? In the 19th century, for example, famous people like many of the people in this book, to have their right handwriting, to own a piece of it, was so desired that at libraries, when famous writers had signed the book plates of books they donated, people would rip them out. Like it was a big huh. scandal. Like if you if you were famous in any way, people wanted to collect your handwriting. It, like having a lock of your hair. Yeah, like a <laughs> lock of your hair. But apparently a lot of books were destroyed like during that time. That That's had fascinating. Been... I, I have to say going to the Morgan exhibition when it was on – you do feel that something's been lost in the typewriter age because there's this kind of direct line between the brain and the page with the handwriting. And, I, and you can it's you see it in the spark of the moment. Well, um, there are studies that show that when you write something by hand as opposed to typing or keyboarding, as they now call it, <laughs> um, showing my age, you both acquire and retain the information better than had you keyboarded right. it. Hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. You've each got kids. What are their signatures like? I feel lucky. My kids have all learned cursive. So for them, a signature means cursive writing, mm-hmm. which they do slowly and laboriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and mock my signature, which they think is, you know, just sloppy and and, <laughs> and, and dreadful. My, my kids' signatures are as different as my kids' personalities. And my, my son, who's 16, would really, if he could get away with just typing his name rather than signing it, I think he would do that. He, he is very much a keyboarder. My middle child, a, a daughter, is she's got lovely handwriting and uh, almost calligraphy the way mm-hmm. that she does her name with the scrolls and everything. Mm-hmm. And and the the youngest is only ten, so I think we're still waiting to see what her signature will turn out to be. What's your signature like, Tina? It's degenerated over the years. I'll <laughs> say it used to be much clearer than it is now. But anyway, so this book also it takes me back to like. Letter writing. I love reading letter collections, and a lot of these are letters. Yeah. And you forget how, you know, if Winston Churchill was going to be at Checkers while his wife was in the city, he would sit down and write Clemmy a letter a few times a week. And James Joyce is in there, if I'm not wrong. Yes, James Joyce is in there as well. Writing about wanting to be a musician. Right. One of my favorites is the Hemingway one, and it's written when Hemingway is 12 years old. (laughs) And... He's writing his father a note, and he says, Oh, I remember. Dear Daddy, I feel a lot better when all my work is done and my conscience is clear. You can tell somebody's <laughs> just gotten in trouble. I looked up in my baseball schedule and found out that the New York Giants will play Chicago. You know, he's like, <laughs> hey, Dad, take me and, to a ball and, game. And it was good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so so it really does run the gamut. It's They aren't – Thing. I'm sure you've you probably haven't seen any of those things before. I know no, I hadn't. Yeah. Anyway, fascinating. So if anybody else has a handwriting and type, you know, obsession like I do, this is a book for you. What's the name of it again? So it's called The Magic of Handwriting, and it's from the Morgan Library and Museum. Pamela, what are you reading? Journalists are famous for being narcissistic and navel gazy and love to read books about other journalists and about themselves. And I've actually been pretty negligent on that front. I, I, I don't live up to <laughs> Not that. Not narcissistic enough? No, I've never read the Gay Talese book about the New York Times. I've read a couple of books about the Washington Post, Catherine Graham's memoir, Ben Bradley's memoir. But if anything, for as much about sort of their their lives and the periods in which they lived as 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 for their professions. And I picked up a book that is the opposite of that. It's about the New York Times, and it's not a pretty look at the New York Times. So it's one of those books that you don't want to walk around the New York Times carrying it. Um, <laughs> and yet here you are on the podcast. And yet here I am announcing to listeners and any of my colleagues who may be listening, but actually it was a colleague who mentioned that she was reading this, and I thought, I have that book at home, and I picked it up. The book is called Hard News, 21 Brutal Months at the New York Times and How They Changed the American Media by Seth Manukin. And I read it, I guess, as a journalist would in, you know, a few hours. It was like a day because it is really juicy and terrible. This is the story of the period at the New York Times during which Howell Raines was the executive editor and Jason Blair, who was a fabulous and plagiarist and really serial, compulsive, pathological, probably, (laughs) liar, was caught 
plagiarizing and, and, and fabricating stories in the Times. And this subsequently, through a series of events, led to Howell Rains and his managing editor, Gerald Boyd, leaving the paper. And ultimately, Joe Lelyveld, who had been the previous executive editor, sort of taking over temporarily, and then Bill Keller becoming the new editor of the New York Times. This was in the early aughts. And this is about 2004, right? Yes, I, yes. I, I This happened... After I was hired by the Times and before I started at the Times, so I watched it in ha- unfolding in real time with kind of horror and thinking, okay. what am I getting into? <laughs> Welcome to your workplace. <laughs> yeah. What was most interesting to me was, frankly, the depiction of how different journalism was not that long ago. You know, the Internet was there. There was a mini journalism recession after 9-11, which people don't really remember because 9-11 was such a cataclysmic event that that journalists really excelled at covering. Yet in the wake of 2001, in about 2002, 2003, there was a media recession. And I remember Time Magazine had a hiring freeze. A number of magazines went under. One of the places that went under was a website called Inside.com, together with this magazine, Brill's Content, where I actually very briefly worked alongside the author of this book, Seth Mnookin. So I was aware early on of this book. But what's so interesting about it is that that this is the beginning of the era in which the Internet is starting to make an impact on journalism, but it hasn't quite yet fully made its presence known. And so the way in which the newsroom is staffed and functions still operates largely along the lines of a print organization and to, you know, be sort of pushed off to the work on the website was the equivalent of being assigned to the Westchester edition of, you know, the New York (laughs) Times. It was just like nowhere you wanted to be if you were an ambitious journalist on the rise. So it was it was a fun, juicy kind of peek at the past, the not so distant past. All right, let's run down the books again. Greg, what did you read? Goodbye, Vitamin, a novel by Rachel Kong, that's K-H-O-N-G, and Ulysses by James Joyce. And Tina? Well, I can't say I read it, but I've been perusing The Magic of Handwriting, which is from the Morgan Library and Museum. And John? I read Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli. And I read Hard News by Seth Mnookin. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, albeit not right away. The Book Review Podcast is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with the great help of my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Mm-hmm.